Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight's uh, newer tech uh, group. Really, really happy to have Samla here. Uh, Samla and I have recently had the chance to meet each other in person uh, at our France Vision Weekend. I'm really, really happy uh, that, yeah, you got nominated into our community. And since then, there's just so many kind of like, I think, over overlapping uh, kind of like alignment of interest and like so many people that I hear that I meet on a daily basis that are collaborating with you. So it's really, really cool. It seems like long overdue um uh that you know yeah we we connected and i must say um just to kind of like tickle people's imagination of like what was done at vision weekend Sumner and team developed this um in their neurotech group developed this absolutely wonderful um neurotechnology existential hope scenario which um to me is, is still absolutely one of my favorite ones and it is this one here so um, we had one of our groups, we had a part of our groups were really casted uh, with the idea of like creating an existential hope scenario that um, uh, kind of like unites uh, the different existential hope visions across different people working on newer technology. And I think this is what you develop by first using, I think, QBD3 and then Dolly. And so kudos for that. Uh, it's a really, I think, inspiring piece of art, uh, but uh, that uh, really takes uh, a lot away. From now, we're really happy to have you here actually to deep dive into your work, which at Vision Weekend, we only got a chance to briefly touch on. And so thanks a lot for showing up. And Wasn't it spring? One of you just Wonderful. You're downstairs over here. Even yeah. I will mute you. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right. Uh, you go, Sumner, and I'll be in the chat. I will share a little bit more about your bio in the chat. And uh, yeah, thanks a lot for joining. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right. So since we have a little bit of weirdness with the uh, Zoom share, I did try, by the way, thank you for those in the chat. I did go check my settings and they seem to be correct. So unfortunately, uh, we're going to do this uh, the tricky way, which I'm going to go through and click on in videos individually. So this may not be as smooth as usual, but all the content should be there. Um, so yeah, my interest has really been revolving around neurotechnology and brain computer interfaces widely for the past 10 years or so. And so I really want to portray what the next generation of these devices might look like. Many of us are seeing them in the news more and more, um, but I think we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, before I jump in, just for those of you that haven't come across brain-computer interfaces before, I want to answer the very basic question, which is, what is a brain-computer interface? At its core, it's a very simple concept. You want to read some kind of information from the brain using different biophysical phenomena, electricity, magnetics, and so on. Uh, using some type of device and technology, then pass that information to a decoder. Now, this is usually going to be uh, some kind of computer uh, and trained with machine learning to recognize patterns in the brain that it has correlated to different types of behaviors. Once it then interprets what the person's intention is or animal's intention, then that is used to control an external device. And that can be anything from a robotic wheelchair, a prosthetic limb, or just a cursor on a screen. Uh, and then what's missing from this is that this also causes a feedback loop. So once you're actually seeing what you're doing, then now you're starting to get visual information or the sense of touch or the side of touch. And now that starts to feed back in the system. And that's where things get really interesting. Okay. So I'm going to answer the question right up front around the next generation of BCIs. Today's BCI generation one are serving this need. The 1.2 million people in the US with paralysis, I, I would like to get the worldwide numbers on this, but I'm not sure where to find them. So uh, for now, we're going to stick to US numbers. But about a, a little over a million people in the US have severe chronic forms of paralysis. That means they can't move. And so these types of BCI devices could be useful for them. But really, where these types of devices come into the mainstream is through brain circuit disorders. And I'm using that term quite broadly. So treatment-resistant forms, meaning drug-resistant forms of depression, anxiety, pain, OCD, these neuropsychiatric and cognitive disorders make up about 21 million people. And these circles are to size here. So you can see the kind of number of people growing as we start to go in. There is also a significant overlap. So that blue and orange circle overlap because there's a huge amount of comorbidity between these things. And that allows you to move through these different um, aspects of a user adoption. But what's really interesting to me is as people start to adopt these technologies for treatment of severe forms of depression, and those technologies start to work, you might imagine it becoming useful for less severe forms of depression. And eventually, the types of anxieties or 
or uh, difficulties that we all deal with on a day-to-day. And that's where this gets really interesting as we head into the kind of all consumers, which is a bit of an infinite circle here. Um, But to see where we're going in the future, I found it's really helpful to get some more context on where we came from. So going back in the history of BCI, starting in 1780, so Luigi Galvani discovered that if you stimulated a dead frog's legs with electricity, that you could cause them to twitch. Now, we all take this for granted today. We all understand that electricity is fundamental to our body's function as human beings and, in fact, for all animals. But at the time, it was really pretty revolutionary. Um, Jumping forward in 1924, Hans Berger recorded for the first time uh, the electrical activity non-invasively in a human being. So we now refer to these all the time as brain waves. And this technology was called electroencephalography, or more commonly known as EEG, which we still use today. Uh, So coming up on its 100th birthday soon. Uh, Jumping forward into 1963, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, just a couple of illustrative examples. Um, This is Jose Delgado, who was quite the showman. Um, So here he's having a charging bull run at him. And you'll notice the charging bull stops very suddenly. If you look closely in Jose's left hand, he's holding this transponder. And that transponder is wirelessly connected to an electrode that's implanted deep in that bull's brain. And when he runs, Jose presses the button and it causes the, the running bull to stop. Now, this is really kind of a crude demonstration, but it's, it's one of these kind of more salient ones that it's like, okay, wow, there's really something here. Um, jumping forward to the first, what I would actually call a full closed loop BCI, now fulfilling that definition that we talked about at the beginning. Eb Fetz, uh, who was a postdoc at the University of Washington at the time, uh, released this paper on the operant conditioning of cortical unit activity, which is a very boring way of saying that he taught a monkey to control the firing of a single neuron in his brain. So Ebb had put in an electrode that was listening at its very tip to just one single neuron. And that neuron's activity was then basically summed up. How many times is it firing per second? And then uh, in front of the monkey, there was a needle and this needle would kind of go up. And if the needle went up to the right uh, place at the right time, the monkey would get a juice reward. And so now this is one where the monkey's controlling the external device very simple, just a needle uh, in front of him, but also getting feedback for doing it. Um, Jumping forward a little bit, uh, maybe, here we go. Um, In the 1990s, we take this forward quite a bit further. So you can see this monkey down in the bottom right corner here, and he's pressing a button to start a task, and you can see this wire coming out of his head. These are early BCI, so a bit crude by comparison to what we have today. Um, But his task is to use multi-unit activity. So now, rather than a single electrode, he has dozens or even hundreds of electrodes that are recording the activity of his brain. Some of his neurons are going to be active when he's intending to move up, some when he's intending to move left. And once you start to mix all of those together and use even basic machine learning methods to discern what the monkey's intention is, he can then control this robot. And his task is to reach out with the robot and grab this black bar. And every time he does that successfully, you can see he gets a little sip of juice. So he's uh, incentivized to do this. Um, And so this is really kind of the fundamental basis of what we think of today for motor neuroprosthetics. That translated into human use in about 2006 with the advent of the BrainGate trial. Uh, They're now putting in Utah arrays. There are these 100 channel microelectrode arrays. So now recording on the order of one to 200 neurons, depending on how many you can detect in any given day. And you can see the one of the early participants in this trial doing all sorts of tasks, moving cursors around here, kind of working with a small prosthetic hand. And so this is where we start to really see the value of the science that was developed in animal models start to translate to people that have real deficits as a result of some neurological injury or disease. In the case of the BrainGate trial, they've mostly focused on late stage ALS and uh, severe forms of paralysis due to spinal cord injury. Um, And I just also wanted to point out on this because this will come up later. You'll notice this is 2006 and the patient is playing Pong and he's he's pretty good at it. It's a little jittery, but it's pretty good. Um, You'll see that again in a moment. Just to give you a sense of what this hardware looks like, this is the Utah Ray, which was developed in 1997 by Richard Norman. No relation to me, although we did come from the same alma mater. Um, And the Utah Ray, again, is 100 channels. Uh, You have four grounds on the edges. So you get 96 electrodes in the brain for each one of these you implant. You can see they're very, very small sitting on the head of a penny, but really these kind of bed of spikes are a a somewhat crude tool. 
Um, but it is still, despite being developed over 20 years ago, the only FDA approved intracortical electrode array for human use. Driving this forward in 2015, uh, our group at Caltech implanted these same types of devices in a human participant. So this is Eric. Um, and so Eric was, we asked him, you have this device, you can do anything you want. What would you want to do with it? And he said, you know, I'm paralyzed. So I have to live with my mom and every weekend I want to have a beer and she'll always get me the first beer. But every time I ask for the second beer, she really gives me a hard time. So if I could just reach out and grab a beer on my own without getting a, getting a hard time for my mom, that's what I would want to do. Um, and so that's exactly what we did for him. And you can see he's pretty excited about that. Um, and this was just in his like first weeks in this trial. So uh, pretty phenomenal control. Jumping forward to now, um, this was just taken last year. Another one of our participants, he really liked playing first person shooter video games before he had his injury. And so we said, all right, we'll code you up a video game. And the reason I like to show this video is because if I hadn't told you, or you didn't know ahead of time that this participant was paralyzed from the neck down, you would have a really hard time telling that just from the video alone. Um, he's extremely good at this and frankly, probably much better than I am. Um, other types of applications are starting to make their way into the space. So these are still motor neuroprosthetics, but there are ways that you can actually uh, create speech or, or direct communication through text. And this one I think is one of my favorites and currently holds the record for the highest bandwidth BCI out there. And this is a, an application called Imagine Handwriting. It was originally developed by a group at Stanford. Um, and this was Frank Willett's paper, came out last year from the Schnoy group where they would have participants imagine handwriting. And handwriting is an interesting one because it's it's kind of open loop in the way that a video game isn't. So you don't really have to watch your hand. You can close your eyes and write for quite a while. You might kind of go off page, but you're still getting the rough uh, shapes correct as you go. And so you can decode this very quickly. We basically look for the motor activity of the hand and the fingers. And then from that, you can reconstruct the trajectories and then using uh, language models correct for some of the errors and um, create something that's really quite accurate. Um, in my position at AE Studio, uh, where I'm the uh, chief neuroscientist, we took this a step further and actually integrated uh, the spiking data all the way end to end uh, with the decoder and the language model all streaming in real time. Um, and as you all know, with large language models, this is only gonna get better. So what you're seeing on the right here is this kind of multi-unit array uh, electrode activities. So there's 192 channels of, of activity streaming through time, and each one of these little specks is a spike of a neuron. And then what you're seeing on the left is what we're actually decoding in real time in a browser. Um, and so you can see, we actually chose one here that he makes a small mistake, or the language model makes a small mistake. Um, let's see, I can't really get to the end again, but confusing talk for table. And you can see the L and a K put together look a little bit like a B, L, E somehow. And so there's, there are some confusions. Um, so this brings us to the first generation of commercial BCIs. So many of you probably have seen the Neuralink demos that have come out. Um, and everyone kind of lost their mind a couple of years ago. And, and a monkey is playing Pong. A monkey is playing Pong. This is so amazing. And it is cool. Don't get me wrong. But as we saw earlier, humans have been playing Pong for quite a while, coming up on 15 years, 16 years now. Um, and so that's not the novelty. What... I think most of the media missed really is the most impressive thing about these sorts of demos from Neuralink and others in the commercial space is what you don't see. There are no longer big pedestals coming out of the head of the monkey. He's not tethered or fixed to any kind of contraption. He can walk around freely, um, jump up and play this game if he wants. Um, the device is wireless, both in its uh, power uh, charging and its ability to, to transmit data. And so this starts to look like a device that you might actually uh, adopt or that there might be large user adoption for, for these paralyzed populations. I'd be remiss not to mention that there are many other groups in the space, um, Paradromics, Synchron, BlackRock Neurotech, and others that are developing similarly ambitious technologies. And in fact, Paradromics has a 30,000 channel uh, system, uh, which is you know about 10 times as many as what the, the Neuralink has. Um, now, this is obviously not as an implantable of a device, and I know they're working on smaller channel count uh, devices as well, but I would fully expect that many of these companies will be coming to market immediately, and, and BlackRock Neurotech is the one that's been making that Utah array, so they have 20 years of track record of making devices that academics have used in clinical settings already. But where these technologies fall short 
is in a couple of ways. One is longevity. So those devices that Eric has, um, that James has in our, in our studies here at Caltech, is that they don't last forever. They last on the order of three to seven years or so. Usually five is kind of a typical number. Um, and that means that you have to go through these really invasive surgeries again. You have to go in, take out the skull, the, the dura, and actually pull these things out of the brain and put in another one or just explant entirely. Um, which is really not a fun kind of uh, time for the, the person that is having these implanted. Um, the other one is diminishing returns. So although we're seeing a large scale up in the number of electrodes, it's still not necessarily true that if you go from 3,000 to 30,000 channels, you're going to get 10 times as much control. Because you're sampling from small regions of the brain, there's a lot of overlap in that activity. And so you, you don't actually get a, a lot more control. But the big one is really coverage. So I'm showing here the Neuroport, which is another name for that Utah array, and the Neuralink. But even the Neuralink with its 3,000 channels, it would take six of those to cover just 1% of the human cortex. And that's just the superficial cortex, nothing in the sulci, nothing in the deep brain. And that leads us to the really big problem, which is if you want to treat more than just motor disorders, you care about all of these neuropsychiatric and cognitive disorders that allow us to expand the user base of DCI, you really have to interact with the entire brain. As an example, I'm showing here a couple of what we know to be a distributed depression networks or, or depression networks that, or the networks that cause what we call depression, which is really kind of a catch-all term for many different underlying phenotypes. And they have one thing in common, and that's that they are occurring in circuits and systems that are widespread throughout much of the human brain. And so if you want to understand these neuropsychiatric and cognitive disorders truly, then you really have to interact with them. Taking that a step further, um, it's not only neuropsychiatric and cognitive disorders, it's also if you want to do kind of true BCI applications. If you think about a concept as, as simple as this cup of coffee I have in front of me, um, that is actually an incredibly complicated uh, concept. It might be about the temperature or the taste of the coffee, uh, the, the shop that I went to this morning that I have memories at. There are so many different aspects of what ties concepts together, and those span the entire brain. So this is actually real data from Jack Gallant's group at UC Berkeley, showing just a kind of small representation of how these different concepts span the brain. Um, so this has an animation, so I'm going to be doing the animation by hand. Um, so the next generation of BCI really has to address this in three ways. First, it has to be large scale. So I'm showing here, instead of these kind of small regions of the brain, interacting with large regions of the brain allows you to access those circuits and systems. Ideally, it's minimally invasive, so it's very easy to implant, doesn't require these very kind of painful and difficult surgeries, and also lasts for a very long time. Uh, most of our patients and user panels in the spinal cord community, for example, have really basically sussed out that these devices has, have to last at least a decade to gain any type of real user adoption. But what this really buys you, if you can accomplish this, is by the ability to sense brain circuits and systems widely throughout the brain, you no longer have to implant for a single indication. So maybe you were originally implanted for a drug-resistant form of epilepsy, but you also have the comorbidity of depression or anxiety you can treat those two. And this is really the paradigm shift that I wanna bring across that happens with the second generation of BCIs, is that now you have a single device, but that single device can address many different indications and applications. So this is really akin to the kind of smartphone revolution in the way that I no longer need a calculator on my desk and a phone, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I have all of those as just programmable applications within a single platform of technology. One of the ways that we think that this is solved um, and what my research has been focused on for the past five years is using a technology called functional ultrasound. Um, so we use ultra fast plane wave imaging. So we send tons and tons of these images very quickly into the brain. Um, and through this kind of temporal structure, skipping over a lot of details, um, I'll just show you the similar part of a monkey brain taken with MRI, conventional ultrasound, and what functional ultrasound buys you. So right off the bat, the resolution is phenomenal. Um, it's about a 15 times the resolution in any given direction, which makes it about eight, uh, 800 times the volumetric resolution of something like MRI. 
And so we start to see uh, red blood cell motion in very small capillaries and arterioles. And that's important because as your neurons use uh, their metabolic resources as they fire, they have to be resupplied through this kind of hemodynamic mechanism. And we can literally see at this very minute scale how the, the neurons are being replenished and therefore infer the activity of the brain. So this ultrasound has a lot of things going for it. First, it's large scale. We can see large areas of the brain, even with a kind of standard transducer this, that is uh, we're kind of taking off the shelf. Um, this is showing a monkey MRI in black and white, and then the red image is to give you a sense of scale of an area that we recorded with uh, ultrasound. Um, it's minimally invasive in that it sits outside of the brain and outside of the dura entirely, which minimizes the risk for infection uh, in the central nervous system. It's safe and effective. We've been using ultrasound for sonography for about 50 years, and it has an incredible track record. So the remaining question was, would it even work as a BCI? And this was my burning question five years ago. Um, and so sorry, some of these animations are going to be a little weird now, but um, I taught a monkey effectively to do these different types of visual motor tasks. So looking at targets on a screen, moving his hand with a joystick to different targets on a screen, a little bit like a video game. Um, but once I did that, then I used the brain activity. And remember earlier, we talked about this decoder that uses machine learning to infer from the brain activity alone and predict what the monkey was about to do before he ever actually did it. Um, and then if we take the behavior of what he actually ended up doing after we made the prediction, we can come up with these what are called confusion matrices. So if our predictions perfectly match the actual activity, you would expect this kind of diagonal structure that we see here. And what this is telling us is not only did we predict when the monkey was going to move, we were able to predict what direction he was going to move, left or right, and we could predict what effector, his hand or his eye, he was going to move. And we could do that all in parallel, thanks really to the kind of wide field of view that ultrasound buys you. A couple of weeks ago, we published another paper uh, driving this forward further, expanding the bit rate. So now you're seeing uh, eight different targets that we can decode. Um, and the other kind of fun thing that I won't show here, but uh, just because it's a little bit complicated to, to show in graphics, but I can just tell you is that we, one of the benefits of ultrasound is we can train these types of ML models on one day and up to two years later, use exactly the same model. And the monkey can literally come in and use the BCI immediately without any retraining at all. That is something that is almost impossible to do with electrodes today. Electrodes really require you to retrain the BCI every day. So what's next? Um, in the next generation of BCIs, what do these types of things buy you in specific applications? So we've talked about the medical applications, but I also just want to kind of tease you a little bit with the types of BCI applications in the pipeline. From the MRI space, um, we already know that there's some cool things that you can do if you can access wide regions of the brain. For example, in your inferior temporal cortex, uh, this is where your brain in the uh, ventral stream is actually starting to put together the, the kind of basic axes of what makes up a face. And if you can decode that activity, I can show someone an image in an MRI scanner as this group did in 2019. And then from the brain activity alone, actually reconstruct the face that they were looking at. So you can imagine rather than handwriting or moving a cursor on a screen to kind of peck out on a keyboard what a person looks like in a description, you could literally imagine the face directly and show that to someone around you. So in terms of bandwidth or the ability, ability to communicate concepts, this would really be a quantum leap forward. Um, I showed this one earlier about the kind of semantic maps that occur across the brain. Similar thing here, you could imagine something that's kind of uh, ethereal in nature and then work in closed loop with a computer that's going to kind of guess its way into actually forming a solid image in front of you. Um, I haven't even really talked about all the things that you can do with stimulation, but ultrasound, as, as do many other kind of biophysical phenomenon, can actually stimulate brain tissue and directly manipulate that. And so this is useful for drug delivery, modulating neural activity directly, which can be useful for treating uh, these kind of brain circuit style disorders. Uh, you could also halt different types of brain circuits that are dysfunctioning, for example, in the case of epilepsy. So there's a ton of applications in that space. Um, and just to drive forward this kind of visual aspect a little bit further, uh, there was a group all the way back in 2011 um, that was actually presenting video in an MRI scanner. 
and you can actually reconstruct just from the brain activity alone in an MRI um, what the clip that they were looking at is. Now, it's imperfect, but I do find this kind of like dreamy aesthetic pretty cool and really fascinating that this is even possible. This is really, really just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I would encourage you to go check out this uh, webpage by uh, my friend and colleague, Milan Svitkovich, who uh, put together a list uh, of all of the different types of future applications. So we've really been focused on disease and disorders over here today. And then a couple of these kind of visual uh, forward-looking semantic type PCIs. But there are so many things about changing your, your mood state, your ability to sleep, um, all sorts of different things, some very utopian, some a little dystopian, uh, which we can always talk about if you like. But I'll just leave you with that um, and say thanks, uh, everyone, for listening. And I, I'm seeing a lot of things pop up in the chat, so happy to take some questions from here. Wow, fantastic. Um, this was really, 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 um, yeah, <laughs> kind of mind-boggling, to be honest. Um, I'm really glad uh, that we got like a bit of a deep dive uh, into all of this. Obviously, we could not cover any of the vision we get, so thanks a lot. Also, thanks for showing us kind of like a bit of the history and for showing pointing out other applications that other people are working on. It's like really cool to see like a lay of the land. That's really cool. Um, okay, well, we have Randa already with a question. I have my foresight questions kind of like always up in petto, but uh, I just like to remind people of the algorithm. It's like, as long as you ask questions, I won't ask any. And when I start asking questions, you can stop me by asking your own. So uh, Randa, you go first. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And by the way, that was a, a fantastic talk. I missed maybe five minutes of it because I lost power at home. So I had to switch well, to my phone. I hope I didn't miss the most important and interesting part. So I'm sorry if what I'm going to ask was something you already answered. No worries. Um, but uh, so I'm going to, and maybe this is going to take you out of your comfort zone slightly, uh, hopefully not too far. Um, everything you've told us is is of course wonderful for patients right and then the last bit that you just told us uh, is, is sort of goes into okay other uses things that bci might be able to do in the future even for healthy patients but that is of course one of the things that say a group like foresight will will often wonder is like where is the crossover between say bci for patients bci for for healing and for taking you know dealing with dysfunctions and then switching over to BCI that would be beneficial to healthy people, which of course comes with that caveat that, you know, it has to be worth the risk. It has to be safe enough and all of that. And, and for, uh, from your perspective, what do you think is uh, something that we could expect or what is it even something we should imagine somewhere on the near term horizon at all, uh, which yeah, I guess raises questions like, hey, do you have a comment about Neuralink? <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. So go ahead, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What you're talking about is this period in which we move over from restoration of lost function to augmentation of existing function. And augmentation is still somewhat of a controversial topic in the BCI space. And I would love to have a very long discussion about what the future of BCI user interfaces and user experience actually looks like. Because today, it's highly skeuomorphic in the sense that we're really just tying BCIs to our existing user interfaces, computers and robotic arms, things that we know and understand. Um, but as we decouple from that and BCI develops its own user inter uh, interface and experience space, um, I think that gets really interesting. On the topic of user adoption, which is where I think your, your question was headed, um, mm -hmm. Where my thinking really, really switched on this um, is in two ways. One is that that switch from restoration to augmentation is really not black and white. Um, I could guarantee that everyone on this call has experienced some degree of anxiety that meant that they weren't able to complete or perform at their optimum on some day, or that everyone on this call at some point has experienced some kind of jet lag or fatigue due to either a life event or just you know moving places or whatever. Um, that means that you weren't actually, again, being the kind of best version of yourself. So that's a very gray area because where does a medical treatment uh, start to just look like, okay, well, I just want to be a little bit better um, and, and, you know, do you want to sleep a little better or be a little bit less anxious? And I think that crossover is going to be, um, it's, it's not exactly in the kind of singularity, like a mathematical sense, one that you're kind of going uphill and all of a sudden you're immediately going down. I don't think it's very steep. It's probably kind of round, you know. It's an uphill battle right now. We're on the steepest part just trying to get, we have to interview dozens and dozens of patients to convince someone that it's worth putting one of these electrodes in their head. 
But as the devices become less invasive, easier to implant, um, then I think that you do kind of start to go over this hill. Um, now, I the uh, the second piece of information that really changed my thinking about this was the number of people in the U.S. that undergo elective forms of invasive surgery that are usually out of pocket. So it's mostly uh, plastic surgery. So someone is willing to have some sort of implant or you know face tuck or what I, I'm not sure. Um, but those are presumably for some sort of psychological benefit. I'm feeling a little happier because I feel a little bit better about myself. Uh, and I'm willing to pay $20,000 out of pocket and go sit in an inpatient procedure that's extremely painful for that little amount of benefit. And there's 2 million people in the U.S. that choose to do that every year. And so if you think about something that's as simple as um, like an epidural style device, which doesn't have to be ultrasound, it can be optics, magnetics, or something else. But if this is just a one inch incision, a quick burr hole, which I know sounds scary, but it's actually, is, there's no there's no pain sensors in your skull. It's actually the scalp. So if you make a very small scalp incision, it's actually a very easy recovery. You could make something like that, uh, an outpatient procedure, an, an hour long, ideally, that you go in, zip zap, you go home. Um, and a large portion of the cost is really the device itself and, and not necessarily the medical costs. If the benefits of that are you feel even just a little bit better um, that's exceeding what you would get from plastic surgery, it's reasonable to start thinking that user adoption really explodes. So that's those are the two things that have changed my mind. I don't know how many years that takes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, I don't know. I guess I, I, I haven't introduced myself, so you probably don't know what my background is, but I did work uh, to set up the company Kernel which um, mm -hmm. currently is producing that helmet with, uh, you know, the flow you know, stuff and all that. And so one part of my curiosity is what is your take? Because you're, you're going heavily on the ultrasound route there. And I'm wondering what your take is on uh, FNIRs. And also, I guess I'm wondering uh, about your thoughts on uh, how important it is to be able to do bi-directional BCI, so being able to stimulate into the brain as opposed to just being able to read from the brain. Um, because reading from the brain, that's where you have a lot of non-invasive possibilities, right? So you don't have to break the dura, and so then things are a lot safer. Um, and, and I mean, it, it does seem a little scary to open up the skull for every patient who wants to have a BCI, um, although you learn a lot of interesting things. Like when I watched my first surgery, I I learned that humans smell like bacon when you uh, <laughs> when you cauterize. <laughs> oh no, we broke Allison's. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so anyways, yeah. So I'm wondering about your your thoughts on on those two different technologies. If you compare ultrasound versus, say, the the near infrared. Yeah, well, they definitely share um, the same biophysical mechanism of hemodynamics, right? So they they do share. Uh, they're like distant cousins in a way. Um, yeah, I don't know. So the the invasiveness versus kind of performance trade off is very real, especially today. So you kind of have the most invasive forms of microelectrode arrays are very high performance, but just so invasive and so difficult that they're really not going to gain user adoption in their kind of current form factor, something like the Utah array and a pedestal up coming out of your head. Um, on the other end, you have things like EEG and FNIRs that are totally non-invasive, um, but there, I think there's there's kind of an interesting question, which is, it really depends on the application space. So if it's, I just need to put this thing on for a few hours a day for a couple of weeks, and that's going to cure my depression, there's no reason to implant that. Um, and in fact, the SAINT trial coming out of Stanford that's doing transcranial magnetic stimulation is making exactly that. That I think their, their trial, I forget the exact number, but it's multiple weeks, multiple times per week, and many, many hours per day. So it's it's a huge amount of time. But they've made the bet that that's still worth not implanting something. Um, on the other side of that is Jacob Robinson's company, Motif, who is implanting a form of magnetic simulation that's going after these same types of depression. And so now you see that there's um, there's kind of competing opinions in the space. Mm -hmm. I think it really just depends on how amenable the protocol is. Obviously, if it was one day in the hospital of TMS stimulation, then done. I'll do that. Don't implant anything. Um, so I think it just depends on what you want to use it for. Uh, the kind yeah. of health and wellness applications that uh, Kernel is interested in, I think it depends on how often you have to to do those. If it's something that you jump up every morning, you put the helmet on for a few minutes while you meditate or have breakfast, yeah, non-invasive makes a, a lot of sense. 
Uh, well, that's, that's the market too, of course. I mean, you're trying to appeal to a very large market. So then you want to go for something non-invasive. That's the yeah. probably main reason there. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, but so uh, there's this other thing, which is more on the science side than the, than say the application side where, you know, um, one of the things that I find striking about the majority of all BCI today uh, is that they naturally are rather peripheral. So they're typically cortical or let's say a cochlear implant or something like that. It's always something where you have on the other side, something in the real world that you can compare to that you have as the data. So you know that, for example, uh, there is um, a world out there with sound or there's a world out there with vision or something of that nature. And so when you're looking at brain signals, you can interpret what they mean because you're creating a connection with something that's fairly closely out there. And the same is true when you're training the brain to use an electrode, because basically you're creating a, a connection straight to something that has meaning on the outside. So my question there from a more science interested side is what does BCI actually teach you about the brain and about neural circuits, because you're not really interpreting what the neural code is. In fact, it's more like you're training the brain to learn about the BCI. And this is different, for instance, compared to say the work that Ted Berger is doing on hippocampal implants, which is deep down there and CA3, CA1, just between brain regions. So you have one region being able to, so one, a, a model being able to interpret the activity of one brain region and then produce stimulation that's meaningful to another region. So how much are you learning doing these kinds of BCI about the brain? Yeah, you've hit on something that has been bothering me for a long time, which is that most BCIs deal with the inputs and outputs of the, of the brain. And that's exactly because you can map them. So motor cortical circuits are almost monosynaptically, not almost, some of them are literally monosynaptically connected to motor neuronal pools which are then kind of directly translated to motor uh, synergies. So you can literally map neuron to activity with like a linear model in a way that's really robust. And that's why these motor applications are so advanced. I think a big problem that of, of that in the space is actually the technology. It's access to that data to start with. So mm -hmm. the fMRI folks are saying we can detect phenotypes of these different neuropsychiatric uh, indications but we can only do it on a population level. And, and maybe you saw the study that was saying that you yeah. need anywhere from 100 to 1,000 times as much sensitivity or data to actually get the effect sizes that you could confidently stratify patient populations into treatment groups. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, there is no way to watch those types of brain-wide circuits and systems over any kind of natural or long period of time. If you have anxiety that is triggered by being in a confined and loud space, then what you learn about that person's anxiety in an MRI scanner is probably not representative of their day-to-day -day life. Um, so I think that there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here, which is that's a really hard question to answer until you have access to the data. And yep. right now there is no way to watch a person's brain at any kind of scale over long periods of time while they go about their day with significant uh, sensitivity. Um, yep. And then the other point that you made about being on the periphery, I would um, just mention that although I mostly agree with you, we don't fully understand the me mechanisms that are involved with deep brain stimulators. And yet, um, despite failing their clinical study for, you know, that's a whole other story, but like deep brain stimulators used for depression will, would almost certainly work if you could reliably target them and you had the right patient stratification. Um, so we, and they're already in use for, uh, for those that don't know, um, for essential tremor and, and Parkinson's. Yes. Uh, that's true. And so and they're actually very successful. Yeah. Extremely. Yeah. And there's hundreds of thousands of these implanted. So, um, often like I do want to under, as a scientist, I deeply want to understand those mechanisms. Um, but there are cases, especially on the stimulation side, that even with limited understanding of the mechanisms, you can make really meaningful therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's Wonderful. actually my last question before I let everybody else have a chance um, is, is on this because uh, you mentioned, for example, the Utah array, and that is still probably the most high resolution electrode array that is currently FDA approved for use in humans. Yep. Um, and I remember that when we were working on this at Kernel, one of the things that we were thinking about when we were still thinking of doing an invasive method was that we would have to develop a new type of electrode. 
because the Utah array just wouldn't cut it, especially if we wanted to be able to go to deeper regions. And uh, that turned out to be extraordinarily difficult and expensive, which was one of the reasons why Kernel backed away from that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm kind of curious to see whether Neuralink actually carries it out or doesn't. And, and Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but so do you have a personal from your experience and your, your, you know, what you'd really like to do? Do you have some view on why is this so difficult? Why is it so hard to get past the Utah array? Yeah. Um, biocompatibility is huge. There's this, this, and you know this, but for those that don't, as you make electrodes thinner and more biocompatible in the sense that they kind of move with the brain, you can think the brain is a little bit like a bowl of jello. So when you stick those bed of spikes in there and this bowl of jello is moving around, you have the stiff bed of spikes, there's motion between the two. And that over time causes this gliosis or glial scarring that eventually encapsulates the electrode tips and insulates them from the electrical activity, rendering them useless over that period of five years or so. Um, so to avoid that, you can make the electrodes much thinner and now they kind of flex with the brain and move with the brain. But now you have the problem that the brain is a really harsh, acidic environment that basically eats electrodes over time. Um, and so the thinner you make the electrode, the more difficult that it is to make them last which is actually a major concern of mine for Neuralink is that they haven't really shared any longevity data. And like I mentioned, you really have to make these things last 10 years to get mass user adoption. I think it's maybe the biggest hurdle that they're facing. We saw them right. putting a ton of money into these uh, accelerated testing platforms, which is further evidence that they're running up against this problem too, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, so my, my opinion is maybe not super surprising given the, um, the presentation I gave. But I think that there's been a lot of exploration on the non-invasive side because the technology is more accessible, it's cheaper to develop, and it, uh, if you can solve it, you get big user adoption. I think that there's, and you know, Kernel is basically first and foremost in that space doing that. Um, on the other hand, there's these everything we've talked about on the invasive side. There are not that many minimally invasive approaches that have been developed by comparison and the funding in that space has been less, the number of people in the space has been less or fewer. Um, and so my my kind of approach is that remote sensing really holds the key. And, I, and I'm and not like just trying to proselytize ultrasound. I think the optics and magnetics have just as easy of a claim to say, yeah, there's some really useful space here. Um, Eric Trotman at Stanford had a two photon VCI. Mm -hmm. um, there was, again, like Motif doing magnetics. And um, I know that Precision uh, Neuroscience is doing these kind of ECOG grids that they slip under the skull and onto the top, the top of the brain. I think that those deli the delivery problem is one aspect, but also if you can get outside of the dura, it makes the surgery so much safer, easier. It might not require a functional neurosurgeon, of which there's only 150 in the U.S. Um, so it solves a lot of problems if you can stay outside of the dura and remotely sense activity. Yeah, thank you. That, and by the way, I think ultrasound is a really interesting approach. It's not just for sensing, but I think even as power delivery, if you have any kind of implanted devices that need some power or some sort of local thing they're doing. Yeah, yeah. so I think it's, it's a wonderful area to, to research. Yeah. Okay, I should stop and let some other people have a chance. <laughs> Here we go. Thanks, Randall. Uh, all right, let's see who is next. Logan, um, really curious uh, about you. Uh, I think you're muted, so. Sorry about that. Uh, I had some somewhat related questions in that, um, uh, but maybe a little more specific. So I was wondering about uh, non-invasive or, or really semi, I guess, semi-invasive approaches that are injectable. Um, and I wanted to get your perspective specifically on some of the nanoparticle-based uh, approaches that we've seen. Um, one thing that I've found really exciting is the idea of using upconversion nanoparticles as a way of either delivering um, blue light to uh, uh, neurons that you have obviously would need to do some form of gene therapy to get them to express the channel rhodopsins, but um, some sort of combination of like a, a, a gene therapy and a um, uh, upconversion nanoparticle or something with uh, a heat generating nanoparticle that changes the local thermal environment around the neurons and modulates their firing. Um, things that essentially essentially take take away the that you can just inject and then take away the um, the problem of 
you can't access these deep brain regions with any degree of specificity or with any degree of precision, because essentially you can use the nanoparticles themselves to sort of achieve precision through engineering. Um, and those are some things that I, I personally see as some of the most uh, promising BCIs, but I haven't, I haven't worked in the BCI space uh, directly. I've sort of ambled around the periphery, I suppose. Um, and so I was wondering what your perspective was on sort of where those are going and what timelines for those types of things might be, if you think they'll get outcompeted by other approaches, that kind of thing. Yeah, I, I'll admit right up front that I'm not an expert on nanoparticles. I find it really interesting, but I'm more of like a, an enthusiast rather than an actual expert. So I'll, I won't comment deeply on that. Um, but what I will say is that what you're getting at is that the delivery problem is really hard. You don't want to have to open up someone's head every time you want to actually access brain function. Um, and I think you kind of mentioned it very quickly, but it's like, oh, yeah, we need to have the gene therapy, of course, which is difficult. But I, I want to stop there for a second. <laughs> gene therapy in the brain and humans is really, really hard. Um, nice. Yeah, the delivery problem for gene therapy is getting good transfection, uh, getting good targeting, hitting the right cell types and getting transfection is really, really hard. But um, we're already seeing advances in that space. So gene therapy in the retina, for example, and retinal prosthetics like Science Corp is developing and Second Sight used to be developing before they went under. Um, I think are really, really promising approaches. Uh, the eye really is very close to being part of the central nervous system and right in there, right into the brain. Um, so I think that exploring that retinal prosthetic space is a very natural foot in the door and a gateway, a, a beachhead um, to starting to do cortical prosthetics. Vision, visual cortical prosthetics are probably the first space because you don't need a huge amount of transfection. Again, being an input to the brain, it's relatively small in space. Hit the occipital cortex, stick some type of stimulator that interacts, whether it's through heat, which is like you can do thermogenetics, as you were saying, or you can do optogenetics. Those there are already uh, valid constructs in that space that I think you can access. One of the limitations that you have there is depth. So optical does really, really well. It's going to be more precise than something like ultrasound if you're in surface cortex. Where, what you don't get in optics is depth. Um, and that's what ultrasound is very good at, is it penetrates soft tissue very easily. So if you can do cell type specific labeling and transfection, um, and then actually interact with that, whether through sonothermogenetics or through direct uh, sonogenetics, um, you can overexpress certain kind of uh, mechanosensitive ion channels. That's a really, really exciting area. Mm -hmm. And it's those multiplicative techniques that are coming out of the genetic space that are being developed in parallel, but kind of separately from a lot of these interfaces, I think when those two come together, they're extremely powerful. Um, and you can also use these techniques to target, by the way, as well. So if you want to do viral, viral transfection at a specific spot in the brain, you can use things like ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier very locally. Um, you can even do chemogenetics in that space. And then you don't even have to have any kind of nanoparticles. You could just take a pill every day and it wouldn't affect you anywhere in the body except that one little spot. Um, that those techniques are currently under development in the academic space with early proofs of concept. Um, and so we know that they're going to work on some level, but anywhere from 10 years to a human therapy in the brain to maybe 50, <laughs> I don't know. It's really wide error. It depends on how well that translation goes. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. Um, actually, just uh, uh, to um, provide some context, my main area of research is uh, gene therapy. And so, uh, at least currently it is. And so I'm uh, using synthetic biology approaches in gene therapy. And uh, I have ambitions of what I'm currently working on, translating it into something that can be delivered to the brain for sort of complex uh, gene editing in the brain. And um, so, yeah, it's really cool to hear from you that like there's from the perspective of, of someone who's working more in like the the biophysical mechanisms that there is at least on that other side of the street there is something that is that, that there's potential for us to meet in the middle essentially oh yeah please yeah work and work fast <laughs> yes <laughs> great nogan that's on you then um okay next one up uh, micah uh, feel free to give very short answers we're almost out of time can ultrasound go through the eye socket, like instead of having to cut a hole and make a window, could you just point it at the eyeball? Yeah, yeah, you can. Yeah, there's actually to get to the brain, if you don't want to put a hole in the skull, you can either go through the eye, you can go back underneath the occipital bone. Um, you can even actually go in the mouth. 
<laughs> uh, which is maybe not like super practical for some things, but you're limited in the regions of the brain you can get to. And depending on the person's skull thickness, you can actually get some uh, information through the kind of zygomatic arts, transtemporal imaging, uh, transcranial Doppler uses that, but it's not imaging. It's just a kind of 1D signal, but you can get some information through there. It's just not very good. Um, in neonates that still have a fontanelle window, a soft spot in their head, uh, you can do neonatal imaging uh, basically non-invasively with ultrasound. I know people are doing that, like basically trying to translate that now into clinical practice. Awesome. And um, just uh, again, looking for a quick answer. The You said you had trouble, people who are paralyzed, I'm surprised that they're unwilling to do a surgery once every five years. Do you have insight? Like why someone like i feel like if i was paralyzed i'd be like you know even if it's for three months give me the surgery i take it <laughs> you know what people, why are people so scared of it yeah um one is that it's these are scientific studies so we can't go out and say you're going to be fixed you're going to be able to move all these things and it's going to be great and although they'll see these types of videos i showed you guys um you know it's a job like they come in three days a week they work all day these patients are like seriously cool people um that, that do this so i think it's a huge commitment I would say just anecdotally, and you know, we don't have data on this. Uh, it would actually be interesting to do a kind of survey. But uh, anecdotally, one of the barriers to uh, enrollment for these types of studies is not so much the people as it is their families. So you can imagine that their families say, hey, we've been through a lot taking care of you. Um, this is a, already kind of a full-time job for us. You're adding on more to that. And you're also going through a surgery that is significantly risky. And if you're at risk for an, uh, a central nervous system infection, which granted, you know, the likelihood is low, but it's not zero. And this is a person who is already an at-risk population because yeah, um, having a spinal cord injury is, is wreaks havoc on the body, not just your ability to move. Um, it's, it's a big hurdle for both the patients, but especially their families. Yeah, I think we're getting your thumbs up there. Um, I can't let you go before I ask our final question, which is uh, if people in this room are excited about your work, which clearly they are, as you can tell from the number of questions, um, then yeah, how can they basically help move your work in particular forward? So that's your shameless plug moment. <laughs> um, well, one is um, just reach out to me. If you're working on something interesting, like like Logan was you know, working in this, uh, this space that's a, it's parallel to ours and I, I can't do what he does. But I want to know about what people are working on. So one, just reach out, say hi. I'm always happy to have a chat. You can reach me on Twitter. I'm, I think I'm at Sumner LN, I think. Ooh, I should probably know that. Um, so that's a good space to do it. But you can find me on Twitter, Google my name, Sumner Norman. No one has that name but me, so it's easy to find me um, and, and get in touch. Um, at AE Studio, we're hiring. So if you know really great data scientists that um, are interested in brain uh, and neurotechnology, uh, please reach out there. Um, yes, I'm on LinkedIn. I saw that come in the chat. I am on LinkedIn, so add me there. Um, and then, yeah, follow the space. We'll, we should have some really cool new stuff coming up in the next couple of years, too. Cool. Well, I hope it wasn't the last time that we have you on. And I think, Logan and Fama, you may actually be meeting at our next Neurotech in person uh, workshop. So uh, at least you, you, you two guys will meet. Anyway, thanks so much for joining everyone. Thanks for your wonderful questions. And Sandra, thank you for this really mind-melting uh, presentation. I think I think you really broke not only my brain, but a few others here too. And hopefully you'll be able to fix them uh, uh, to, to some extent uh, uh, in a bit. No, but seriously, thanks a lot for taking time. It was really wonderful um, to have you present. And thanks everyone for joining. And I see some of you tomorrow for our like end of the year virtual member gathering where we review top projects across the space. Uh, and uh, many of you uh, I'll see again in... Uh, January for our uh, next annual uh, take summer. So thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, Allison. Thanks everyone for the great questions. Bye.